morning, church. My name is Adonis and Akirutimana. <coughs> Everyone, ma ma many of us know me. Uh, when I was told to do this morning pastoral prayer, it was a difficult week for me. Uh, it's a week that we buried my um, brother in my brother-in-law. And it's also a week that I was expecting to have a good news from immigration for my family reunification. And I got an opposite. So it was tough for me, but I'm strong in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we remember the Pentecost Day, this Sunday we are here as a church to praise you and to remember that Jesus, when you left us, you didn't leave us alone, but you promised the Holy Spirit. And he came on the day of Pentecost. And the disciples were full of joy and praise. Today we hear saying, Lord, you are great. Saying, Lord, you are great. Father, I take this opportunity to pray for our Pastor Marcus. He lost his father-in-law, and his wife now is traveling to London to attend the funerals and the stuff. Father, be with this family, and especially strengthen our Pastor Marcus, and use him. We know he's living difficult times, but Lord, he still has to do, and lead us. Lord, be with him and strengthen him. We pray for Jane Collins as he urgently needed to fly to England. Lord, you have been with her and you will protect her in, every, in everywhere she is. And also, Lord, be with the children. Lord, we pray for Rodney Draper as he has taken over the responsibility of church finances that he will have to clarify the purposes and the, our Lord Jesus will guide him. Lord, we pray for Annette Levis for more better living time. We pray for kids club and protein that God would provide all the leaders and the volunteers needed to run safe the programs. Lord, we pray for Youth Alpha that you know Jesus will be strengthened. We pray that God will give them the leaders and the wisdom that is needed. Lord, we pray for the women's fellowship, Tricia Tan and Janice Norton. And the Lord, let your Holy Spirit lead them and that you will help them to be organized for this ministry. Lord, we pray for Matt Old, who has sorted in Florian Polis and taken the training seminar in Baptist Church. Lord, we pray for Liz and all the staff. We pray for the, um, for the ministry of um, children and the NB at the NBC. Lord, we pray for John Norton. John Norton, who has the, uh, the, the Fry Road Grand Returns, uh, that the Tri, sorry, that the Thai Road Grand returns to producing the right amount of uh, thyroxine that his body needs. Lord, give uh, wisdom to the doctors who are helping him. Lord, we pray for Damien Kusser and his continued healing. Lord, we pray for Judean Carter to recover. We pray for Isabel and Carol, as well as Nadine and Hale, as they are transitions or they are new no more. Lord, we pray for the whole family of the NBC, for those who have health challenges, 
including Carol Lai, Bruce, Michael Hockley, Jeremy Loy Combs, John Purzen, Joyce Cambridge, and the others. Lord, we pray for our church leaders, church elders, uh, Ali Ottenhoff, John Gospro, Rodney Draper, and Roger Smart. Lord, give them the wisdom and the strength they need to help the church grow. Lord, we pray for the church leaders, Pastor Marcus, Nicola, Julian, Ricky, Nikki, and Susan. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead them in everything they do for this church to prosper and grow. I pray everything, Lord, that you will also remember everyone that should not be mentioned in this short prayer, but who really needs prayer, peace, and a good health. Lord, we pray for peace in Ukraine. We pray for peace in Africa. We pray for peace in Asia, everywhere that they need peace, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and everywhere else. Lord, you are precious. And we pray for our missionaries, Dasha in East, Afri in East Asia, Darren Susan in South Asia, Susie in Central Asia, Matt Ord in South America, and Sylvia Yuan, who is serving in your crowns, and many others. Thank you, Lord, for you hear our humble prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. When the Feast of the Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard one after another their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these the Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up and backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews! All of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billowing smoke. The sun turned black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. Good morning again. I think it's generally true that people are always looking for ways to improve, to change their lives for the better. I mean, think about all the commercials 
and advertisements that come across our way that try to sell us stuff to boost our well-being, from diet and exercise products to skin and beauty enhancements. People try to find ways to change, but not just in relation to their appearance. We want to improve in all aspects of life. I mean, isn't that a major reason as to why we go to school, to grow, to learn, to be better prepared uh, for what is going to be coming later on in life? That we get trained for jobs, that we go to conferences or seminars, that we visit doctors or counsellors. People want to change, and we want to change for the better. So let me ask you this, rhetorically speaking, is there anything about yourself that you would like to change for the better? Maybe another way to ask that is, if you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? The way that you look? Maybe something about your health? What about focusing on a particular skill or field of work that you're interested in? If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Now, I said that it's generally true, that people look for ways to improve, but I also believe that God is interested in seeing change take place in you as well, that he's interested in your development, in positive transformation coming to you. Now, as was said earlier by Sasha, last Sunday in the Christian calendar was Pentecost Sunday, a day that we remember the pouring out of God the Holy Spirit, the, the igniting of the Christian church. And because of that, it ignited significant change in the lives of people who would in turn cause positive change and effect in this world. Now, unfortunately, as she pointed out, we got the dates wrong, and that's why we're focusing it on today. Now, as we delve deeper into our understanding the meaning behind this event, it is my hope that we will be encouraged in our faith to see that God continues to be interested in transforming our lives and circumstances, not only for our betterment, but ultimately for His glory. It is true that all we can bring to God is ourselves, warts and all, and that by His grace, love, and mercy, we are offered a way to get things right with Him. Because God rescues us from our sins, and in so doing, He begins the process of healing us and helping us to put things right. In other words, he develops our lives in such a way that they begin to bear resemblance to that of Jesus. This process of restoration means that there are certain things about you and me that God will want to change. But the question is, what are those things? And how does God plan to do that? Well, let's look at his word to help us understand all of this. Now, in the account that we just watched on screen, we see that there were two major things, two significant changes that took place on the day of Pentecost. The first change related to what happened to the disciples, to the followers of Jesus. Now, we know from Scripture that the disciples had come to believe and profess that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior that God had promised. But the thing is that even though the disciples had come to a deeper understanding of Jesus and of who He was, they were still confused about a number of things. So, for example, prior to the events of Pentecost taking place, we know that they didn't fully grasp Jesus' mission. They didn't fully understand as to why he had come to earth. They were still wondering if Jesus was going to be an an earthly king. And because of this confusion, it bred in them a a timidity, apprehension, a lack of confidence. In other words, they didn't fully grasp the bigger picture. They were lacking something. Now, you may recall that prior to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, uh, he was with his disciples, and he shared with them about what was going to happen to him. And during that conversation, and you can read about this in John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus said that God the Father would send a counselor to be with his disciples, and that being his Holy Spirit, which is the power and presence of God. And the Holy Spirit would continue the work of God in the lives of those people who by faith had accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now this happened in order to fulfill the prophecy that the Hebrew prophet Joel had foretold some 500 years earlier. Through him, God had said, 
I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream visions. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, that, the fulfillment of that prophecy came on the day of Pentecost. And we read that the disciples were gathered together in a room, in a place somewhere in Jerusalem, when the sound of a blowing wind came down from heaven. And that what is described as tongues of fire settled on their heads, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign languages, languages that they had never learnt before. Now, as all of this was going on, a crowd had gathered close by, drawn by the commotion of what was taking place with the disciples. Now, we know that Jewish proselytes from all over the known world had come to the city of Jerusalem for worship, principally because of the Pentecost festival. Many now stood aghast and listened to these Israelites speak in their, in their own languages, in their, in their own tongues. And they spoke to them, as Scripture calls, the wonders of God, which I would assume they're going to be talking about Jesus, who fulfilled the prophecies which they had come to believe in as Jews. Now, the account goes on to tell us that at that time, the apostle Peter stood up and he addressed the crowd, and he preached a message that God the, Holy and Spirit, God, the, God the Holy Spirit inspired him to share. And as a result, 3,000 people were converted to faith in Christ on that day. Now let's look at the changes that took place on that day. No longer were the disciples confused about who they were and what they were to do. They now understood God's plan of salvation completely. No longer were they timid. Now they were confident, publicly and uh, publicly speaking out loud, boldly. I mean, look at Peter. Two months earlier, he was so afraid of the consequences of knowing Jesus that he denied ever knowing him. And now he was speaking to the crowd with confidence and understanding that he had never had before. And so the first major change that took place at Pentecost related to what happened to the disciples. The second major change had to do with the greater gathering of people, the crowds. Now, as I said before, after Peter preached his sermon that day, 3,000 people came to faith. Now, we don't know much about them, but what we do know is that the city of Jerusalem was packed with people because of the festival of Pentecost. Now, back then, Pentecost was an agricultural festival. God had told the Jewish people to gather in Jerusalem 50 days after Passover to celebrate the harvest. So Jews from all over the Roman Empire, all over the Roman world, came to do so. But the real unique thing that happened on that particular Pentecost, and at that particular Pentecost festival, was that 3,000 of those people, 3,000 who had never even heard of this Jesus before, were changed that day. Their whole way of life, their whole way of looking at God, at themselves, at the world, at eternal life, everything changed for them in that moment. The Holy Spirit was the one who converted them that day. And because of their conversion, because of the change that took place, they now were a people who walked with God in such a closer way. They had a deeper certainty of heaven and of how to get there. They now knew that they were at peace with God and Jesus Christ was the reason for this. You see, I believe that Pentecost can be summed up in just one word. And that word is change. We see the change that took place in the disciples that day as well as the change for those 3,000 people. Now, if we look at the world today and everything that is happening in it, we see change rapidly occurring, some things for good, which can indicate progress. However, there is still so much that is wrong and hurtful and evil, and change still needs to take place. But let me say as a side note as well, there are some things that don't need to change. There are things that are absolute truths, truths about God, that regardless of what era you come from, they don't change. 
and we need to hold to those always. As Christians, we acknowledge that Jesus Christ has touched our lives, that the Holy Spirit is living and active within us, and that we are being called by our Lord and Savior to embrace His way of living and in turn bring that influence to bear on the world around us. And so as Jesus' disciples, there is no need for us to be confused or weak or timid about who we are and about our mission in this world. The same Holy Spirit who came to indwell in those first disciples is the same Spirit who lives in us now and who helps us to live for Christ. The same Spirit who put fire in the belly of the apostles is the same Spirit who continues to do so today with believers everywhere. The same Holy Spirit who brought about life-giving change for those people long ago is the same Spirit who enables uh, enables us to change for the better today, who makes us into the image of Christ and who helps to bring godly change to this world. Now, As I have been sharing this morning, some of you might be thinking, I don't like change. And Marcus, I don't think I need to change. In fact, I don't want to change. I'm all right the way that I am. Well, my response to that is this. The Bible is full of stories of transformation, of life change that occurred because of someone encountering God who is holy and righteous. The scriptures outline that the human condition is opposite to the nature of God, that we are sinful, that we can retain sinful habits, and we are inclined to give into these. We stumble and fall and falter on a daily basis. However, God has given us a way of overcoming the cycle of sin. Jesus, through His Word, and through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, challenges us concerning our behaviors, our attitudes, our mindsets, our words, our thoughts, our lifestyles. And as He does, the Spirit starts to empower us to be self-controlled and loving and joyful and forgiving and repentant. These kinds of qualities stem from our Heavenly Father, and they begin to take root in us when... When we surrender ourselves to the power and presence of the Holy Spirit who is at work in us, change will begin to occur. You see, God is in the business of change, bringing about true change in you and me. He is in the business of redemption, of renewal. And the change that He leads us down enables us to be more like Jesus. More like Jesus. Now, in biblical times, certain colors came to symbolize the meaning of various festivals. And so for Pentecost, the color that came to represent its meaning was red. But why was that? Well, there are all manner of reasons to this. But for the Christian, it reminds us of Jesus' blood which he shed as payment for our sins so that true change can take place in you and me. Red also reminds us of the tongues of fire that descended onto the first disciples' heads. Red reminds us of the invisible fire of faith that burns inside of us. Red is the Spirit of God, His power and presence living and working within us. Red, the fire that enters our lives and burns away sin and shame. You see, what happened on that day of Pentecost ignited the Christian faith. It lit the fire of the Christian church, which has been burning for over 2,000 years. And Jesus is continuing to fan the flame of Holy Spirit fire in each of us. But we have a part to play in this. We have a responsibility in this. It is our responsibility to allow that fire to penetrate all aspects of our lives so that sin can be burnt away and the presence of God to infill what remains. And so where does this leave us? Well, let me ask you. Are you allowing God to fan the flame of the Holy Spirit in your life Or are you deliberately putting things in the way to stifle, to limit His work? 
Are you truly open for God to bring about change in you? Or perhaps are you ready for God to begin something new within you? On this day, as we remember the significance of Pentecost, can I encourage you to take time to reflect on the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Where do you stand with Him? Perhaps, just perhaps, you might fear Him because you don't know what He's going to ask of you and where that might lead you. Maybe, just maybe, you've become dry in your faith. You know that you haven't been relying on God, but rather in your own strength. You haven't been relying on the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps you have an issue with control. You you like the idea of having God influence your life, but you fight back whenever He puts something in front of you that challenges you concerning your behaviors, your attitudes, your decision-making. Maybe you're so parched and arid inside of you that actually what you need is a fresh outpouring of God the Holy Spirit, of living water to bubble up inside of you to truly and honestly rejuvenate you so that change, real transformation can start and go forward with you. The life of a Christian is supposed to be led and empowered by the Spirit of God every day. And so as we apply God's Word, as we engage in prayer, the Holy Spirit works within us to transform our hearts and lives. He convicts us of sin, He guides us in truth, and He empowers us to live according to His will. Through the Holy Spirit's presence and leading, we are enabled to bear spiritual fruit He also equips us with spiritual gifts and empowers us to serve others, building up the body of Christ and fulfilling our calling as His disciples. The Holy Spirit helps us to discern God's voice, providing wisdom and guidance and understanding as we navigate the complexities of life. Therefore, the bottom line for us in all of this is this, is that we are to continually seek the guidance and infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We are not to grieve Him. Let us be sensitive to His leading, surrendering our will and our desires to Him. And so this morning, in these next few moments, I would like for us to prayerfully reflect on what has been shared. And, and please do so where you're seated. Um, but we take the opportunity to talk with God about this matter. I think this is when we need to engage in prayer. And, but we also need to go back to the Word. And so if you have your Bibles with you, whether it's physical or on your phone, look at the book of Acts chapter 2, which was that video clip earlier, or, or the, the, the reading from the prophet Joel chapter 2. Engage with the Word. However, there may be some here this morning who have come to the realization that they know they need God to attend to what is going on in their world, in their life, what is going on for them. They are looking to Him for renewal, for a fresh outpouring of His love. For those that are in this place this morning, we have created a a, a space off to the side, just over here this morning, and for people to pray about that matter. And what we would like to do as a church family, as we are a house of prayer, we have people who are very fervent about prayer in this church, And they would love to be able to pray for those people who are in that particular space today, who are wanting a refreshing touch of the Holy Spirit in their life. Now, for those of us, that might not necessarily be the case, that we're actually walking in step with the Spirit, and that is wonderful. So the question is, what could could be done for you? What, What you might be able to do in these moments? The best thing that you can do is to pray for those who are in need of a refreshing touch of God in their life, who are dry in their faith, who are thirsty but are not being filled. You can pray for those in your your family who might, or your circle of influence, who might be needing a fresh touch from God. Or you could be praying for this church in general and for His Spirit to wash us afresh and to rejuvenate us, encourage us, So let us approach this time prayerfully.
and reverently, open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'll give a couple more instructions in a moment. Before I do, let me pray as we enter into this time together. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer with grateful hearts, acknowledging you as the giver of every good and perfect gift. And today, Lord, we specifically lift our hearts in praise and thanksgiving for the precious gift of your Holy Spirit. We recognize him as the promise fulfilled, the one who dwells within us, guiding, empowering, and transforming our lives. Lord God, as we rely on you, please open our minds and hearts to receive your wisdom and understanding and revelation. Help us to grasp the depths of your love and the riches of your grace. We long for a deeper intimacy with you, Holy Spirit, as we seek to walk closely with you in every aspect of our lives. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that without your work within us, we are powerless and prone to wander. And so we humbly ask for your forgiveness for the times we have neglected or quenched your spirit. Renew us, Holy Spirit, and ignite within us a fresh passion for you and your kingdom. Teach us to listen to your gentle whisper and to heed your guidance and to be obedient to your leading. Holy Spirit, we pray for a fresh outpouring of your power and anointing upon this congregation. We desire to be people fully yielded to your will, walking in unity and love. Bind us together in the bond of peace that our love for one another may be a testimony to the world of your presence among us. And we lift up those among us who are hurting or discouraged or burdened. Comfort them, Holy Spirit, with your peace that surpasses all understanding. Bring healing and restoration and renewal to their lives. Surround them with your love and provide them with the strength and courage to press on. And Lord God, we also pray for the lost and those who have yet to experience your life-transforming presence. Open their hearts to receive your saving grace. May the light of your truth shine brightly in their lives, drawing them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We commit ourselves afresh to be vessels that you can use, Heavenly Father. Mold us, shape us, and refine us according to your perfect will. Empower us to be bold witnesses of your love and truth in our families, in our workplaces and communities. God, may your Spirit continue to work mightily in our midst, transforming us into the image of Christ and equipping us for the work of your kingdom. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I would give the world to tell your story Cause I know that you called me I know that you called me God.